markets and where the uh, where the housing market is expected to go. So uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and introduce Josh and then we'll get started. Thank you, Rex. I appreciate it. Um, So hopefully what I can share today will be interesting and informative. Um, some market trends, what's happening in the state. Um, and any at any point along the way, feel free to stop and ask questions. So I'm happy to go. Um, I can go through the slides pretty quickly and answer questions at the end. But I think it's it's really more interesting if you stop me along the way, ask questions, happy to dive a little deeper. Um, I've changed this a little bit um, because I've been getting a lot of questions on interest rates lately. Uh, owning a mortgage company, you guys all in the real estate um, uh, world, you, you're getting uh, a lot of questions on that. So I, we're going to dive into that a little deeper than I typically do. Um, but hopefully, just just uh, ask any questions, stop me, have me, you know, start over, uh, whatever helps. So um, but I do want to tell you a lot of the information I'm going to get. So I'm lucky enough to sit on the Gardner Policy Institute board, and this board um, is at the University of Utah, and they really focus on what's happening in Utah 50 years out. So a lot of times they look at business leaders and politicians who like to think six months or a year out at most. This institution says, hey, let's look 50 years out, let's look at what's happened in the state over the long run, so we can really make some plans in terms of um, uh, infrastructure, other types of developments that will really impact the, the state in the long run. So not just, not just a short-term focus. A lot of the information comes from there. I'm also um, privileged to sit on the shelf of the homeless board. Uh, so I see on, on this, at this board, I see a lot of the affordable housing issues. So I'm working a lot uh, with different mayors of different cities um, to help address some of the affordability issues and why we're having such affordability issues and we'll talk a little bit about that and, uh, and how some of those issues can be addressed. Uh, before I really get into it, I do want to kind of do the, the caveat saying almost everything I'm going to present today could be negated by a few big events. So one would be um, any kind of cybersecurity threat. So cybersecurity is, is playing a bigger and bigger role in our everyday lives. You don't you probably don't see a lot of it. Uh, if you're banking, your banks are seeing it by the millions and billions of times a year. Um, so they're getting hit at, at, un, at unprecedented levels to try and infiltrate their systems. Um, the electronic grid is getting hit. In fact, uh, I was just at Rocky Mountain Power, and they'd been over, um, they were over in Ukraine with their Ukrainian partners, and they were watching their computers and learning some things, and they were educating a little bit on how they do different things. And the Ukrainian computers, as they were watching them, were taken over by another outside party, and watching them be their their uh, their uh, electrical grid was being manipulated, and, and they assumed it was Russia that had infiltrated that. Um, but this happens a couple times a week. They just lose control of their computers, and it's taken over by someone else. So we don't know how much uh, our systems have been infiltrated. We assume they have been at some level, um, but kind of across the spectrum, um, that that can play a big role. North Korea is a, is a concern. We don't know what's going to happen in North Korea. Uh, tensions are kind of mounting there. We kind of ebb and flow a little bit, but that, that is a risk. NAFTA, uh, this this weird, really, Utah in particular is a net exporting state. So these free trade agreements, and uh, um, we'll talk about the Chinese trade war as well. So when you talk about these things, it affects Utah more than most U.S. Uh, states because we are a net exporting state. Uh, and then finally, global warming. Uh, we haven't had rain in a few months, and it kind of comes to everyone's mind. It's like, hey, Maybe the, maybe the climate is changing. Uh, there's still debate on how much um, humans are playing a role in that, but uh, the fact that the climate is changing, I think, is, is universally accepted. Um, and so that, that can really play a uh, pivotal role in what's going to happen in this state. Um, so now I want to just kind of take a step back and look at U.S. economic conditions and what's happening across the country. Um, one of the things that you're all obviously interested in is interest rates. Uh, for a long time, we anticipated that they'd start to move. They really are moving now even faster than we predicted. Uh, so those rates are, are really climbing. The mortgage rate is, um, is, is getting back, not even to normal levels, but it's, it's coming back that direction. Um, so this will show you, this is a historical mortgage rate. So you can see we're at the far end there. So you look in the 80s, um, I, I don't think we'll ever get back to that 18% interest rate, 19% interest rate, although some of you may have had homes at that point. Um, and, and you know, we're accustomed to those interest rates, but I don't think we'll get back to that. But showing that three and a half, four percent is really an anomaly um, and not not something we expect, ever expected to last. And uh, now that we're coming out of it, it's painful. No one likes these new five percent numbers. Uh, anytime you kind of go from a four to a five or a three to a four to a five, those first numbers really hurt and people um, kind of cringe when they see it. But really, the five percent is is probably normal, and six I think will be the new normal. Uh, but we don't we don't know when that'll happen. Uh, what's driving the rise in interest rates? Um, so, like anything in the economy, 
uh, price is really driven by supply and demand. And so supply is the supply of money, how much cash is in the economy, and demand for loans. And so that's really what's what's driving, at the end of the day, what's driving, um, so you kind of look, here's the uh, supply and demand curve for those of you who remember Econ 101. Um, and, and this is really what's driving. We can get into specifically what supply, um, you know, what those are, but um, that's one factor. The second factor is inflation. So as inflation increases, uh, interest rates will naturally increase. And that's obviously because a bank doesn't want to lend money to get paid back with money that's worth less. So they, they think, hey, if inflation's increasing, I want to get paid back at a higher rate. So my money, when you pay me back, is worth the value that it is today. So inflation will automatically increase interest rates. Um, and here, you can kind of look at the inflation numbers. Um, inflation's still relatively low. Um, and so that's not really driving interest rates a lot right now, although there is some expectation that interest rates will rise. Uh, the final thing is government, um, the manipulation of the federal funds rate. And this gets um, a little confusing. You guys probably watch it do eight meetings a year uh, and talk about whether they're gonna have a quarter point um, interest rate um, increase. And so I wanna talk just a little bit because it's really important. And this is uh, what I think drives a lot of these other two. So um, the federal funds rate, um, is really responding to inflation, and it's helping drive supply and demand. So this really, this number plays a really big role. And what is the uh, the federal funds rate? You get, I don't know if it is helpful for you to go through, but I, I'll explain it really quickly. It's basically uh, what banks pay each other to borrow money overnight on an unsecured basis. Um, so what one bank pays another. So when the Fed raises the interest, the federal funds rate, um, I bought, it, it's uh, it's kind of confusing. They don't actually just go out and say, hey this rate's going up, your banks need to pay more. Because that, that number really is market driven. So what they do instead is they put money in or pull money out of the economy. And they do that by essentially buying or selling US securities, um, the ones that have already been issued. So they can increase the money supply in the market or decrease the money supply in the market. So when they say they're gonna increase uh, federal funds rate by 25 basis points, it means they're going out and buying or selling securities. That's right, Tim. <laughs> so, um, so it really is just kind of manipulating. So when the federal funds is increasing or decreasing interest rates, they're manipulating how much cash is in the economy. So they either put it in or they pull it out. And that, in turn, affects how much uh, banks are willing to pay each other. So, um, so it really comes back again to supply and demand. So all this is kind of happening right now. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have a lot of control over any of it, um, but we can monitor what's happening, where it's happening, uh, where expectations are, so we can kind of prepare for the future. So. Uh, traditionally, with low interest rates, uh, which is what they've been they've been pushing for a long time, so they've had a lot of money in the economy. Uh, it increases asset prices and helps get you out of a recession. That's why mortgage rates were so low for so long, because we're still trying. The government was really trying to get us out of the recession. So it drives up values of assets across the board. So you've seen home prices increase, commercial prices, everything's been increasing, and now they're scared of overheating. They don't want to push it too far, so they're starting to increase the, that interest rate just a little bit. Um, so we yeah, right. Is, in your opinion, do you think they waited too long, or should have been started a little sooner? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, as a real estate investor, I'm glad they did it as long as they did it. <laughs> so uh, it, it makes our assets really valuable for a long time, and kind of builds those prices in. So uh, I mean, that's debatable on both sides. I think they probably went a little too long. Um, although, you know, I, I think as you know, a, a business investor, the longer they go, the better. Um, but you, but. The counter to that is what's happening to the federal deficit, which is ballooning, and what are the long-term effects of that. So there's, I mean, it's kind of a, there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, oh, and so you. there's a lot of things, there's a lot more at, at play here of why they're raising and decreasing than just these factors. Um, and you know, a lot of it um, we don't need to get into, but we do understand what's really pushing interest rates. So uh, we do anticipate that interest rates are gonna continue to rise uh, over the next few years. Uh, so I think you know, these 5% interest rates that you're starting to see right now are the new norm. Um, I, I don't anticipate them coming down dramatically because the economy is doing so well. I don't see the Fed bringing down that rate. Uh, current expansion. So the last um, real uh, recession that we had was a long time ago. In fact, we're in the longest period of economic expansion in US history. So as of August 22nd, we kind of hit that date. That's the longest we've ever seen. Um, now that might scare some of you and say, oh my gosh, we're due for a downturn. The counter to that is that the, the recovery was slower than average. So most recoveries are really fast. We haven't even gotten to a point of most recoveries in terms of overall percentage gain. So we're still a little below that. 
which is my, why most forecasters today are saying we at least have two to three more years of economic expansion before we're, we're due for another recession. So uh, the recovery has been long, but really slow. Um, also, yeah, man. probably starting from, we, we, we started at a very low point because where the recession was so dramatic, yeah. right? So that recovery, yeah, so. if you chart it out, you know, 1995 to now, maybe it's not too crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we got hit so hard, this was a, a bigger downturn than most. Uh, and so, yeah, so the, the recovery itself, is, is we still have a ways to go. We're back to where we were in the 2009 levels and beyond even in some areas, but we still, we still have a lot of room for growth. So um, most economists are still predicting at least two to three more years of economic expansion. Um, so focused on Utah a little bit. So this is showing job growth uh, in the nation. So 2017, uh, you can't really see that very well, but Utah, 3.1%, largest job growth in the nation. We tie with Nevada. Uh, so really a robust market, robust job um, growth in this state, which is really good news for us, um, leading the nation. Uh, personal income growth, which is uh, obviously correlated to job growth, but personal income growth is increasing. Traditionally, we've been behind the national average. Uh, the U.S. traditionally outpaces Utah. We finally kind of caught up and are now outpacing the U.S. So the gray bar right there is uh, the U.S. Um, income growth. The red bar is Utah income growth. So we're, we're finally outpacing the national average, which is uh, really exciting news when it comes to purchasing power. I need to start thinking about homes, uh, what people can afford. So talking about some of the impacts in the local market, Salt Lake City Airport. Anyone know how much money they're spending at the airport? 3.6 billion. 3.6 billion, someone nailed it, that's it. Uh, so just about to go out to market for another $500 billion um, bond. The good news, um, so the good news is None of this is taxpayer funded. So even though that's a really big price tag and kind of makes you gas for 3.6 billion, uh, we are not paying for that. So no one in this room is paying for it. It's paid through airport fees, some bonding that'll be repaid through airport fees and through some of the airlines. So it's a big number, big spending, um, and, uh, and really been a, a boost to the economy. Um, the first phase will be done in 2020. Um, I was actually just out there this week at the airport kind of looking at their plans and what they're doing. Uh, and phase, 20, phase two goes through 2025. That's when they start tearing down the existing airport. And it's interesting, they kind of tear it down gate by gate. So they can't afford to take the whole thing out at once. They're going to kind of do one gate at a time, build, tear out the next gate, build. And so it's going to kind of, it's going to take a little while. That phase is much more complicated. First phase is an entirely different location, but the second phase is, is on the existing airport side. So we have uh, eight, Eight more years of this, nine more years of this. So it's it's going to go it's going to go a long time. So um, I guess seven more years. Uh, but uh, really exciting. Prison relocation project. They're spending. I think they were supposed to spend like four hundred million or three hundred. Uh, we got lucky enough. They went to eight sixty. This is taxpayer funded, so we are paying for this one. Um, and uh, but another obviously another huge boost to the local economy. What they're spending at the airport. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, what's kind of happening? In terms of employment, so we talked about the largest employment. Oh, yes, back there. Sorry. Oh, that's no problem. So they say 2021 um, is when they're supposed to finish. Um, I think they're on target to do that. Um, and that's then at that point, they're going to kind of scrape the existing site. They have 700 acres out in um, Draper. They're going to scrape that site, start developing there. So that'll be um, and a lot of commercial there, a little bit of residential, but a, a Interesting project that's going to happen out there to also have a real boost in our economy. Yeah, yeah right. Is any of the money from the Sun Valley Acres going towards the Hayward? Yeah. So they are, I mean, it's all state funds. And so it goes, some of that money goes back to the state. This goes out. So in one pocket, out of the other. Um, but the, the site doesn't begin to pay for that, which is what kind of they thought hey, we'll pay for it. It'll be free. Uh, we're not even close. So it's going to be expensive. Um, so the effect of some of these and everything else that's happening in the market um, shows you where we are in terms of uh, current employment right now in the state. So um, we're actually, that yellow bar right there, which is like 3.2%, is full employment. When you get beneath that number, you get into this overheated employment uh, situation that we're in now. So um, those that you guys probably deal a lot in the construction industry, you may know, you may have heard the stories. Uh, about people coming out to job sites and saying, hey, 
if you'll come work for me, I'll pay you two bucks, bucks more an hour. Uh, a lot of that's happening by the airport. So the airport, prison, they're stealing a lot of employees. They go on to the job site. So you've got a home builder who's building um, you know, a few 50 homes a year. They go on to their site and say, hey, we need a framer and we're not just gonna pay you more. We'll guarantee you have work till 2025. Uh, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, um, nice offer. So they're stealing a lot of employees. So you see the construction industry in particular is really faced with um, low unemployment right now. Um, you can combine that with um, what's happening at the border. We're letting fewer people across the border, even seasonal workers, legal workers. We've really cut down on, on legal um, immigration across the border. So that's hurting our construction industry. And then finally, kind of the trifecta, the millennials don't like swinging hammers. Uh, so uh, the Wall Street Journal did a big report, basically said millennials are not going to the construction industry, um, and so they're going other areas. Uh, there's a gamer that makes a million bucks a month just playing video games. So they're like, hey, that's, to me, that actually sounds really fun. If I were like in college thinking about what I want to do, gaming sounds pretty fun, uh, especially at a million bucks a month. So, um, but millennials really are looking for different type of employment, um, and, and construction is really not a, a strong suit for them. So, the construction industry, uh, I actually think for my kids, I'm looking at like their future, the construction industry makes a lot of sense if you can figure out um, uh, how to get involved in that, and, and it's, it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not going to be replaced by computers, at least in, in large scale. So, um, but we really don't have enough employees right now, particularly in this market. So, when you see uh, you'll understand. We get some later slides. This this is affecting the the housing market pretty dramatically. Um, U.S. debt. So we talked about U.S. debt is rising. Um, so we talked a little bit about that with interest rates uh, and, and why they went on so long um, putting money into the economy. They were borrowing that. Uh, they were borrowing that money to put it into the economy. And what does that do? That really increases interest rate or the the national deficit uh, and the debt. Um, and so that debt is number is ballooning. Uh, getting pretty extreme and continuing to grow. Uh, the last tax cut uh, that the Republicans passed was uh, an economic boom. Like it, it definitely stimulated the economy, but it added dramatically to the deficit. And it used to be uh, two, three, four years ago even, uh, this was a big kind of Republican crying call to reduce the deficit. We're still having a lot more babies uh, than uh, the national average. So um, my wife and I contribute pretty heavily to that. Um, <laughs> We have seven, which is a lot of fun, but the national or the Utah average is a little over two, uh, while well, the national average is under two at this point. Um, in migration, so you look at that gray bar on the on the bottom there. That's how many people are moving into the states. So we have a really robust economy in terms of drawing people from out of state and having them move in. Um, and uh, and finally, um, life expectancy of uh, of. Uh, men and women is increasing across the board. So we're living longer, having more babies, a lot of people moving in. Uh, the net effect is essentially we're adding a city the size of Bountiful every year in the state of Utah. So, um, so really big population growth. Um, Utah geography, so this, this is actually a really interesting map that I found um, just doing some research. Shows the average age across the nation. And this, this uh, the guy that put this together is a guy named Peter Zihan. And he's a big believer that um, that demographics really drive, are one of the biggest drivers for economic indicators, uh, what's gonna happen in your economy. And he says that one of the biggest things you can look at is the average age of a population. And the lower the age, the more likely you have um, good economic future. So if you look at this, uh, you can see the Northeast is really red. You kind of go from the Midwest, a little orange. As you come west, uh, much yellower, that's a younger. And then Utah gets its own color, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so our, uh, our average age in the state is under 33. So as you look in you know, New England, average age is almost over 40. So we're, that seven years is actually very significant. And it really kind of um, tells us that we're gonna have a very strong economic future in the state. So let's talk about what that actually means, percent of population change by county over the next 50 years. Um, so I think I can zoom in on this. Yeah, we can zoom in. So Utah County, 176% population growth over the next 50 years. Salt Lake, 54%, Summit, 80 um, Wasatch, 186 um, So let's talk about what that means. Absolute population. So that means Salt Lake City over the next 50 years is adding 600,000 people. Um, Utah County, a million people. You don't know the, exist or the current population in Utah County? It's about 500,000. So it's crowded at 500,000. When you're going to add a million, it's going to get very, very crowded. 
A lot of that growth is going to happen in South Utah County where there's still a lot of rooms. So you're looking Salem, Payson, Spanish Fork. Uh, those are areas that are going to see a lot of growth. Um, but uh, you're going to have to squeeze a million people in. Um, so the net effect is that Utah and Salt Lake County uh, will be almost identical in size in 50 years, which means you're really going to have a city uh, that goes from uh, essentially Ogden to, to Provo, uh, one city. It's just going to be completely filled in. Um, so, yeah, Rex. Is the state going to keep up with the infrastructure? No. <laughs> um, so, That's not a good thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> like so the right now, this is why, so the legislators were presenting this report, and this is why you saw, I'm trying to remember which, who it was, one of the legislators said, well, I think the only solution on I-15 is to make it a double-decker. It has to do two a stack, and uh, that doesn't make sense. I mean, the expense of that um, is not realistic. Um, but they can't go any wider. Uh, I think they're just about all the way wide, and we're going to fit, uh, we're going to essentially double the population. It's actually a little more than doubling the population in the next 50 years. Um, so what, you know, what's the solution? Um, I, my hope is that technology plays a really big role. Uh, so as you look at self-driving cars, and what self-driving cars can do on a road versus what we can do, we're all, you know, you guys, I don't, Utah drivers are the worst I've ever seen. I've, I've lived a lot of places, never seen anything like Utah, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Utah driver, I guess, now, too, so. Um, but drivers are imperfect, so when you think about a, a self-driving car, you can think, hey, maybe there's one or two or three lanes on the freeway that are dedicated to self-driving cars. They can drive 150 miles an hour, three inches off the bumper in front of them and never get to an accident. Uh, so that's, you know, as you think about what's going to happen, that's not going to happen next year or the year after, but maybe 10 to 15 years from now, that's that's a solution. Um, you look at, you know, where the growth is going to happen, how else you can get to different places. If you can create, live, work um, communities where people aren't having to commute as much, tele telecommuting, all that kind of stuff, trying to keep people off roads, starting work at different hours. Um, but the actual infrastructure, can we keep up on the roads? No. If, if nothing dramatic changes. So, and that will impede growth. So as you look at what's going to potentially change some of this, if we can't address some of those issues, I'll have a hard time growing. So I do talk about that. So some of the other challenges, uh, air quality. Uh, we are we're in a unique state that has uh, air quality challenges. We've come a long way. So you can see the red bar is Salt Lake, Salt Lake County uh, from the 80s. You see how many days out of compliance we were in the 80s. It was <coughs> almost, almost every day of the year we were out of compliance. We've come a long way, but we're still kind of in that 30 to 40 days a year. We're out of compliance, which is still very unhealthy. We get national recognition, we do that. Uh, stops job growth, people come into the state, they hear about our air quality problems, we wanna talk about it before they move in. So that's still gonna be an issue we have to address. Traffic, we just talked about. Yeah, Matt. Well, have the restrictions become more strict over here? Over On air quality? Uh, yeah, so uh, technology, again, has played a big role. So catalytic converters on the cars, the type of fuel people are burning, all that kind of stuff has really helped on, on some of the pollution. Um, a lot of it is industrial pollution, so um, they've cut way back on Kennecott and how Kennecott was, um, what they were doing. Kennecott basically had free reign to do whatever they want, had no pollution control whatsoever. Cut way back on that and a, a few other big, big pollution uh, companies. So um, that's been a lot of different things, uh, but vehicles still is over 50% of the pollution. What about the compliance measurement? What is the compliance measurement? Uh, it's yeah, they are. It's getting a little more strict, and there's um, federal there's federal compliance numbers that they just rolled back. So you know, I was hoping Utah would stick ahead because we'd have some unique challenges. We didn't, so we kind of went ahead. And now we come back um, to the current administration. So let's see what happens. That's kind of it's a bit of a moving target, but from the '80s, dramatically different. Yeah. But yeah, but the last two or three years kind of bounced back and forth. Uh, traffic we talked about. Um, yeah, this. There is going to have to be major east-west infrastructure put in. Um, North-south infrastructure is going to have to continue to be expanded um, in, in any way we can, uh, and hopefully we we'll find some other solutions on that. And, and why is that? Because uh, our geography is really unique. So we're not Dallas or Columbus, Ohio, uh, or Phoenix that can grow in any given direction and, and it's, as far as the eye can see. Utah, we're really constricted. So we have a lot of federal grounds, uh, which is the mountains, on the east, and then we have lakes, uh, physical barriers on the west, so we're really constrained north-south uh, and how we can grow. Uh, there's a few pockets, you know, Eagle Mountain and Saratoga, where you can go um, east-west a little bit, but even those are constrained by traffic uh, because they build the houses and every, everything's kind of been put in without, uh, without really thinking about the impact on roads. So we're gonna have some constraints there. 
So now I want to focus really specifically on housing. So what does all this mean to housing? Uh, and what's going to happen to our housing market? Um, first, I think it's important to understand that from 2008, uh, we, we had 78% home ownership. We've dropped that number down. Uh, so we're dropping uh, in terms of overall home ownership rates. We're now at 71%. Um, and I, we'll talk about why that is. Why is home ownership rate decreasing? You guys might have some opinions on that. Um, but what's happened since 1991 in the state is Utah has been the fourth fastest increasing um, housing price index in the nation. So in terms of states, we're only beat by Colorado, Oregon, and Montana. So Utah's housing price is growing fast, really fast. Um, in fact, uh, in terms of metro areas, Salt Lake City was the, the seventh fastest growing, Provo Orem the eighth, uh, or the twelfth fastest. So in, in 1991, a home, an average home price in Salt Lake City uh, was $76,000. I, I, I doubt any of you have listed a $76,000 house, maybe, probably not even a trailer, $76,000. Um, I don't know what you get right now for $76,000 in Utah or in Salt Lake, but it wouldn't be much. Uh, so the average price, this is in 2017, is 307. I think they're close, we're a little closer now to 350. So this last year has actually even spiked even a little faster. So that number is going up really fast. Um, and this, this number uh, is really important, I think, to understand. So what happened after the last recession? So in the, we, we got hit just about as hard as every other state in the last recession. So you see what happened in uh, Vegas. You saw what happened in Phoenix. Uh, they kind of, they let out nice and early for us. We could see them crashing. Uh, by the time we saw them crashing, it was too late for us to get out of it. Uh, but we follow that trend right now. So we, we had a massive market collapse. Uh, I was buying lots for you know five thousand dollars for a finished lot for a little while there. It was just like it was complete annihilation of our uh, from our housing market. Uh, however, Utah was the second fastest state to recover. So what does that tell me? It tells me that we really never should have had a collapse in the first place. Uh, Las Vegas, they were overbuilding. They had massive investors coming in. A lot of mortgage fraud. And we get into you guys want to talk mortgage fraud? We can explain exactly what happened, uh, why we had mortgage fraud what caused it and where it really affected. Um, there's a lot of mortgage fraud, a lot of investor, um, people buying homes, didn't have, weren't qualified to do it, but buying because they were doubling their money every couple of years in Las Vegas. Uh, and so you had massive collapse in those markets and a massive collapse here because we follow national trends. However, we recovered really fast. Um, and that's because our fundamentals were really good. We didn't have a lot of investors. Uh, we actually had a housing shortage, if anything, uh, and should have never really experienced the, uh, the downturn that we did. It's not to say we won't do it next time, because we will, um, but shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened. Um, so right now, today, in terms of the most expensive states in the nation for housing, Utah is number 12. But that should be surprising to a lot of you uh, in this room who have always thought of Utah as a really affordable state. Uh, we are still, and I want to make this clear, we're still a very affordable state compared to many, uh, because there's a lot of other factors at play in terms of affordability besides housing. But when it comes to housing, our housing has appreciated so fast and so far that we're now the 12th most expensive state in the nation. Um, why is some of this? Why is this happening? Um, Utah housing. So this this graph right here, the gray bar, shows how many houses you're building. The red bar shows how many people are moving into those houses. So it's healthy to have more houses built than people moving in because some of the houses just become um, obsolete and are torn down. So you always have more houses being built. Uh, than people moving in. So a lot of them are you know, replacing existing homes, that type of thing. So you should typically have 10 to 15 to 20,000 more houses being built in a healthy economy. So if you look in the 80s, I'll zoom in on that. Um, you had about 24,000 more houses built. Uh, sorry, that's in the 70s. In the 80s, you had you know, t about 20,000, 18,000 more houses built, or sorry, 20,000. Uh, the 90s, again, um, just about 6,000 more houses built, so getting a little tighter there. Uh, the 2000s, we jumped back up and we built about uh, 50,000 more houses um, and then, or uh, 30,000. And then you all of a sudden jumped to uh, 2011 to 2017. So only the first half of this decade and we are 50,000 houses short. So massive, massive housing shortage. Um, why, why is that? Obviously the biggest part is because of the last recession. So coming out of the last recession, home builders were really nervous and they didn't want to build houses. They just got burned. A lot of them went bankrupt, couldn't even get financing to continue to build. So you have a 13,000 housing shortage in 2011. So we're way short in 2011. We finally start to catch up a little bit. So we're, you know, it's dropping down. The housing shortage is dropping, decreasing every year. 
We get to 2014, the economy really rebounds, and we start adding a lot of people to the state. So, um, so we continue to have, uh, for the next three years, um, and, and this year, in fact, uh, four to five to 6,000 housing units short of where we need to be. Uh, so you talk about you know, why home ownership rate is going down, uh, why prices are going up, all that kind of stuff. A big part of it can be explained by that. Now this housing shortage is expected to continue at least until 2020. So we're adding a lot of people and not building a lot of houses. Right. I know there's some big hedge funds that are buying up houses in, in Utah mm -hmm. in, in, in a big way, kind of quietly too. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How much impact is that having on on the uh, housing shortage? I don't know enough about specifically what's happening or what they're building or if they're putting uh, people in there. Um, so I, I don't know enough specifically to tell me. You, you tell me, what do you think? I, don't know, I, I think, well, I know that the, it, there's been some institutions that have been buying up properties and holding them as rentals mm -hmm. because they obviously knowing that it's going to appreciate. I think it certainly uh, sucked out some of the supply for first time home buyers yeah. and could be contributing to a shortage in, in the housing supply. Absolutely. Matt. Are these households, uh, they, are they apartments here or the doors? This is, this is uh, residential housing units. Okay, so it could be an apartment. No, this is, sorry, this, oh, is, all this is single family. family. Oh, single family home, sorry, single family home. Um, so, good question though. So what if you incorporate apartments in that? That's a good question, I don't have that data. But I do have apartment data. I actually have an entire thing done purely for apartments, but I haven't combined them. But I figure for this room, it's much more interesting to go through housing than apartments. Yeah. Um, and anyway, we can get into that, but so what, uh, what's the effect of this? So you see uh, housing units are staying on the market average of 15 days. Um, that is, you know, we can talk about what's happening more recently. I think that number is starting to creep up a little bit, why I think that's happening. Um, but either way, we're still in a historically very low um, days on market. Um, so I'll talk about, so we talked about supply is going up, uh, or sorry, supply is constricted, demand is high, uh, cost is also very high. So. Um, in terms of what's driving home prices. So this is uh, from Ivory Homes. Uh, they gave us this data. Uh, drywall in the last 10 years got up 15%. Cabinetry, roofing, siding, lumber, everything's going up dramatically. Lumber, or siding in particular. We talked already about um, labor. So you add labor into this. So you think about the cost for the home builders is going up dramatically. Especially with the tariff uh, situation. Tariff situation, yes. So in terms of steel, all that kind of stuff, well, those prices are going up. I think I saw that Ford Motor Company said they lost a billion dollars in the last quarter they would have made had there not been tariffs in place. Uh, so, uh, or didn't make a billion dollars they would have made. So, um, but permit and impact fees are going up dramatically. So the highest state, the highest city in the state, and I, I don't actually know which one it is, but I've heard someone guess it was Draper. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate. It's 23,000 for an impact fee uh, to build a home. Uh, average is, is still 15,000, but that's that's a really high number. So you think about how much, um, how much money these home builders are making, a big portion of it is getting sucked out by the cities. Uh, land improvement cost is up dramatically as well, up to uh, 52,000. That's just to put in the, the underground utilities, the asphalt to get to the house. Those numbers are going up. Uh, so across the board, these numbers are going up. Things are getting more expensive. And so as you look at affordability, um, which is where I want to talk now. So what's what's happening in the, in the market? Where is housing going? Um, so I see really two forces that are pushing really hard in opposite directions. So. Um, in terms of driving house prices up, we have a major housing shortage, uh, way more people than we have houses. Um, that's expected to continue. Uh, material and offsite costs continue to increase, labor shortage, limited land, all that's telling me that housing prices long-term are gonna go up. Um, so as I think about long-term, Utah is a fantastic place to invest because we have all these constraints, we have a really growing market, uh, it's really healthy, uh, and so long-term, I see Utah housing market going up. Short-term, uh, it's a different story. So. Uh, driving prices down, increasing interest rates. Uh, the interest rates moving up, I think, are going to have a bigger impact uh, than even housing prices going up. So you, pro you probably are seeing now for the first time uh, that your home buyers are seeing when they get their payment numbers are kind of gasping a little bit. Uh, this is happening particularly as you look at um, people looking to, to move from a three or four hundred thousand dollar house into a six or seven hundred thousand dollar house. So. A lot of people have made money, they've got um, an equity in their home, they've been paying it down for a long time. Anyone that's been in, in the housing at this point is probably in a three and a half to four percent interest rate range. Uh, that's where they should be if they've refinanced at some point in the last few years. And so those people who are now, they have equity, they're making more money, they're getting a raise of their job, uh, they go out and, and look for a new house, 
Uh, they, they go sit down with Rex, and Rex finds a nice gray house. They sit down with Matt to get their pricing and realize the interest rates went from three to five. And, uh, and that housing price, so the house didn't just double it, sometimes tripled their payment. Uh, so even though it just went up a little bit, that, the payment on the house got up dramatically. So a lot of those people were kind of calling them frozen out. So they're all of a sudden, wait a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on hold for a little bit. I can't stomach the thought. I mean, I can't stand the thought of moving up, paying that much more for a new house. And you guys have probably seen this uh, in, in your listings and people you're showing. So most of those kind of four or five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar plus home buyers are actually out of state buyers who are used to these prices. Um, but Utahns uh, who will sit in, in uh, line at RC Willie for an hour and a half for a free hot dog, <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to pay that new payment. So, so they're kind of. We, we kind of really call them frozen out. So there's a whole segment of the market that's not moving up like you traditionally would. Uh, so part of that, a big part of that, was caused by just having interest rates low for so long. We really have frozen out a big part of the market that doesn't doesn't want to move up. And so it's not opening up those lower end ho homes. Uh, for new buyers coming in, so the, the lower end price is really where you see housing shortage, not so much on the higher end. And so the higher end sitting a little longer, and the lower end is, is much more, um, is, is, is people really want to be into those homes, but they're just not a lot available. Um, home builders, we show the expanse on the home builders, they're, they, they really can't cut their costs any more than cut them. They can't be at a lower price. Uh, and so we really have a market that's, that's a little bit in flux. Uh, and so what happens short term? Short term, I don't know. Um, I, we've seen some slowing, certainly, um, because and really it's not a demand issue, it's an affordability issue. Uh, people just can't simply afford uh, the payments that they're seeing on these $350,000 starter homes. Uh, you, it used to be a ninety-seven or hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 starter home, it really is a $350,000 starter home right now, and the payment on that has just gotten too big for a lot of these um, new home buyers. And so, you're seeing potentially a little slowdown right now, um, and uh, and we'll see how that plays out. I think, um, but long term, I think it's important to understand that long term, the fundamentals are still really strong in the state. So even if we see uh, a short term slowdown, some things happening short term in, in the market, um, in terms of a good whether or not now is a good time to buy in Utah, I would say absolutely, um, because you look at the housing shortage, you look at where interest rates are going or where we believe they're going. Uh, and you look at our current prices, and, and it's still a fantastic time to buy in the state. Uh, you might uh, be nervous over the next six months as, as housing softens a little bit, but we're not going to see anything like we saw in 2009. Uh, that, that was caused by a lot of other things. Um, this will be an entirely different market if it slows. We will likely follow national trends. We are seeing a slowdown right now in Washington State, uh, Northern California, New York are seeing a slowdown. Uh, and so we may follow those trends just because that's what we do, but we shouldn't, is my point. Um, we will, but we shouldn't. So, uh, long run, we'll recover like we did last time. We'll recover out of it quickly, um, and the market will be back strong. So, in my opinion, it's still a great time to buy, great time to invest in a residential house in Utah. Uh, in terms of, especially if you think about across the country, where would you most want to live? Is a state that's growing, has a young population, uh, and a really good set of, uh, of fundamentals. There's a question in the back. Yes. Yeah. Have you heard of any long-term predictions like 10 or 15 years on mortgage interest rates? Uh, I haven't heard anything that far out. Um, there have been some wild uh, projections in terms of what's going to happen over the next two or three years um, that I don't necessarily believe. No one really knows. But the reality is if, if we got into a global conflict, uh, interest rates would actually decrease pretty dramatically. Um, there's uncertainty. People, people flee into safe, um, safe investments um, and mortgages are typically seen as safe. It'll drive rates down. So there's, there's so many factors at play and what's going to happen and what the economy looks like. I think it's really hard to predict more than just a few months out. Um, but we do anticipate the natural trends to kind of get back to a more historical level, uh, which is in that 5 to 6 percent range, uh, which is more historical. But, you know, as you talked a little, a little bit about national debt, you think about what the government would have to pay if they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to buy or sell bonds for the price. Um, if, 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 mortgage, if rates increase much higher, the rate that they're going to have to pay on the interest on those bonds is going to get massive, and it'll actually eat the entire economy. Uh, it, it, so it's so the government does have incentive to kind of boost it up, but not too high. So I, I don't think it's going to get crazy high. Yes. You mentioned a couple times the fundamentals. What do you group into that that term? So demographics, I think, is really important. Um, the the land availability of land uh, and its lack the lack of land we have, but I, I think the, the population growth and economic growth are two of the biggest things we have. So we're gonna have a lot of jobs, 
Uh, we have a young workforce that wants to stay in the state. Uh, we're not losing a lot of people like other states to other to other states. So if you look at California right now with their tax policy and other you know other policies they have. They're driving big and small businesses out of the state at an, alarm, an alarming level. Uh, they're moving to Nevada. They're moving here. Um, that that's a real problem. Utah has a conservative um, state leadership that's interested in low low taxes um, and hopefully investing in the future in some degree. Um, and so I think those things together really create a robust economy. Yeah. Where would yes. someone go to uh, make sure this information is current up to date? I mean, what are some websites that? So a lot of this, I mean, honestly, I just kind of, you just start searching. You, I read the Wall Street Journal every day. A lot of this data is on, in the journal that they talk about. Uh, federal funds rate, all that kind of stuff is uh, updated daily. We can see where it is. The federal funds rate right now is at 2%. And that's really, their, or it's a little under 2%. That's their target. That's where they want to stay. And we'll see at every, uh, was it every two months or so, we get a new announcement on, on where they're going. Just we, I follow that pretty closely. I make sure I know where they're going. Uh, and where people think they're going is almost more important. Um, so people, I mean, if you read in the journal, you'll know where, where most investors think the federal fund is going to move, uh, which is really going to, which is really telling us where the you know, long-term interest rates are going to go. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So I do want to just end and say, I, I really, I can't predict the future. I don't know what's happening, um, <laughs> especially short term. Um, long term, I think it's a little easier to predict and say this is long term going to be a very strong housing economy. Um, Utah's a great place to live. We have a lot of uh, amenities that other states don't have. Uh, the fundamentals we talked about, and it's just a really good place. Short term, it, it was really kind of anyone's game. Um, we, and there's so many factors at play that really kind of impact what can happen over the short run, over six months or a year, um, but still a fantastic time to invest. So thank you guys very much for your time. I'm gonna have Matt Barrett stand up. Thanks, Josh, for doing this presentation. Um, as you said, I think Utah's a great place to live and invest in, so thanks everybody for coming. And Rex wanted to say a couple yeah. more things. So. Yeah, yeah, and I, I can't thank you enough, Josh, for coming out and sharing this information. I mean, you you definitely have your finger on the pulse. It's information that we as realtors should know. You know of course, we sell homes, but what we're really selling is uh, information, and we're advising and counseling our, our clients, not just telling them you know what that home's worth and here's the paperwork to, to, to get it, right? We want to we want to really uh, be able to educate our clients and 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 for ourselves understand where the market's going so we can you know shift our businesses in the direction we need to go um, we we really appreciate everyone coming today we do have a sign-in sheet and so if you'll if you haven't signed in if you would we'd appreciate it because what we'll do is we'll keep you on an email campaign to give you updates about the market as we're getting them we're really our team is really big on understanding that data and trying to you know figure out where the market's going so we know where to spend our time and our energy and our marketing dollars and we're happy to share it with you as well so please do that again thanks everyone for coming hey, Rex, do you mind if i say one quick thing yeah. about intercap and matt yeah so matt helped put this together i really appreciate him getting me out um matt is uh, one of our loan officers at intercap lending uh we have um we moved to the state about two years ago is that right matt was one of my first hires in the state um it's just an incredible guy matt and annika and their team uh, just a really good team so if you guys uh, have, don't know these guys, I'd love you to get to know them and, and work with them. Uh, just a really fantastic team and we think we're doing uh, lending the right way, really um, really try to take care of our borrowers in a way that, that they want to come back and, and stick with us forever. So um, that includes, you know, from top to bottom, just giving the best service we possibly can. But Matt's a great loan officer. We also got Bert back there. Oh, do we have another loan officer back there? Brittany's back there. We've got a few loan officers here. So introduce yourself to any of the intercap guys. Um, we'd love you to use our services. Let me, let me add to that. I've been doing real estate, it'll be 30 years next year, and one of the big things that I've learned is that, you know, we don't really sell a home unless someone gets a loan most of the time. We do have cash deals every once in a while, but let's be honest, we, we, we need someone to get financing to get that home closed. Uh, it's one of the most important pieces. I can do my job, but if the financing doesn't go through, we don't get paid. I found Matt through chance, and I gotta tell you, I have a certain level of lender I like to work with, and he's even above that level. Uh, he he and his team get things done in a, in a way I've, I've just, I've rarely experienced. Uh, not only do they do deals great when we're, we've got our typical buyer, but honestly, he saved a couple deals for us. He's working on one right now that uh, the, the comment was, uh, as we brought this buyer in, that's the buyer on my listing, whose lender failed, was, you did more in two hours than they did in five weeks. So uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to work with Intercap, unbelievable company in terms of their processes, 
and their ability to get it done. That was the most important thing for us. And then their personalities were wonderful too. So anyway, and Matt's here if you have any questions for him. There's some other letters in the room if you want to talk to them or pass your cards around. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming.